I was just telling you about importance of bonding through some means of some type of bonding. It may be ionic or covalent or the van der Waals. So whatever is the, the reason that atoms get connected or get bound to form the solid and each one of them take their respective position or the equilibrium position and that is given in terms of a b c alpha beta gamma and so we get a 14 space uh, uh breve space or 17 crystal systems that's what i said so now you quickly see the charge density contours so you may know from quantum mechanics that the uh, probability density is a mod psi square. When that is multiplied by the charge, it gives the charge density. Why I want you to have a picture of this in your mind? When the two atoms come, when I say they are coming together and maintaining an equilibrium distance, they are getting bound. Then there seems there the charge density surrounding in that is the outermost charge densities are the ones which interact with each other and form a, a, a bonding condition. Now you look at the structure. This is a well-known sodium chloride structure and it takes a specific uh, positioning and it forms NaCl structure. The two atoms being the first group sodium and the uh, seventh group chlorine. Now you look at this. We know it is a classic example ionic uh, uh, bonded uh, case and a one seven group that is an element from first and the, an element from seventh forms an excellent and a pure ionic bonding. Look at the distribution of charges uh, that these are called the contours surrounding the sodium and also the chlorine. So the size goes into it and, uh, and the charges, so how they are uh, surrounding and you can see them bound. So if at all you get a chance to see how the distribution of charges are surrounding these atoms, this is how it would be. Suppose I take a silicon, which is a, a covalent solid. It belongs to the fourth group and therefore it is because of the sharing of electrons. So now you look at this, the two silicon atoms which are forming the solid and covalent so sharing and it is very much different from the previous one. This kind of a circling would be, circling would be an ionic character. See now you can look at this, this kind of an enclosing behavior, where this contour would mean the sharing of electrons or covalent bonding in silicon. Now you take uh, of the, uh, group, one element from the third group and one from the fifth group, gallium arsenide. So now you look at this, it has a, a different feature. This is what I was mentioning as uh, the uh, uh, mixed nature of bonding. And always the contours are drawn along the plane, which has a maximum occupancy of the atoms. So this one, one zero plane, we have shown the charge density. This is how it is. So uh, now I just want to have a, a, a picture of this in your mind clear. So let me so, show the comparison. The silicon is an elemental semiconductor and pure covalent bonding. This is how it is. Gallium arsenide is a binary semiconductor. And can you see this uh, features will be different. Uh, this is how we can uh, endorse uh, how the interaction between various atoms involved in bonding through charge density contours. In, in, in recent research using density functional theory, drawing the Dodger charge density contours to scaling, these picture science is showing a rough picturization, that's all. But you can draw a very good charge density contours with the three dimensional views, with the scaling on it, and which would be very helpful in interpreting the properties of the solid. So how do you get this? The origin is a bonding and then it has formed a particular crystal structure and the charge density distributions are like this. Okay, so this is a two-dimensional solid. So now everybody is talking about two-dimensional materials and in or under the category of materials or solids and reduced to dimension. So this is the graphene, the very famous uh, two-dimensional carbon and you see the charge density. So this is silicene, which is two-dimensional form of silicon, two-dimensional form of germanium, two-dimensional form of stenin. This is the picture drawn uh, or calculated by one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Dr. Benita Merlin. And uh, 
she has published a papers on this so if you get a hold on those papers you get better picturization so this is a basically a, a pure um, a, a sp2 bonding and as you move down the period so all of them carbon silicon germanium tin they form the same group but you when the two dimensional form is taken the sp2 and sp3 hybridization mixture why i'm talking about hybridization basically bonding how the electrons do interact with each other so sp2 sp3 hybridization occurs and that results in puckery and those who do research in this would understand me better so all the time trying to say is this is a current research and you see how the contours are uh, changed so this has got a maximum sp2 sp3 hybridization and this has only sp2 and this has mixed sp2 sp3 hybridization contours differ we visualize this calculate your properties in the first relevant zone and you see this bonding nature this mixed nature impacting your results and impacting the properties and therefore for vari variation in their respective application now very quickly let me see Bo uh, let me just to show you bonding and physical properties so I, uh, why do we give so much importance to bonding every type of bonding the medium by which these atoms are bounded together formed together to form the solid have got to impact in the property as i've been telling you if it is ionic see some of the characteristic uh, nature it has a high melting and boiling points so pure ionic crystals have low conductivity and they're soluble in polar solvents, so opaque at high frequencies, high hardness, uh, non directional in nature, brittle in nature. These are by and large some of the uh, characteristic properties associated with the ionic bonded solids. Covalently bonded solids, by and large, they, have hard and they are hard and brittle and low melting and boiling points compared to ionic crystals. Bad conductors of electricity and certain compounds like HCl in aqueous solution allow electricity to pass, and they are uh, and and you have their own characteristic properties. Similarly, with the metallic bonded case, good thermal and electrical conductivity, good ductility, less uh, stronger than ionic bonds, opaque to light, melting point vary from moderate to high. They are by and large crystalline in nature. And the band of water solid, that's a very weak bonding. So it has low conductivity, low melting and boiling points, weaker than hydrogen bond, and it is non-directional in nature and generally it is soft. And therefore, we are able to understand this kind of behavioral pattern or the properties are decided by the bonding, or I can put it this way: bonding has impacted the properties. So, with this, let me go to crystal. So now to summarize whatever i have said the atoms come together through some type of a bonding they take preferential for equilibrium position so based on the position they take a b c alpha beta gamma decide the structure and once they are falling into seven crystalline uh, structures you can investigate them taking their single i mean uh, taking a crystal as it is like you be a tetragonal rhombohedral monoclinic like that now you know what crystal is. Now I am moving on to the next important concept in solid state physics, and that is the lattices. So lattices are uh, from the crystal structure. So we know every crystal has got two lattices associated with it. One is real lattice, another one is a reciprocal lattice. We need to have clarity in what real lattices and what reciprocal lattices. Now, real lattice. Let me deal with the real lattice first. Real lattice is expressed by three vectors A, B, C. That is what we were discussing. When all the real lattice is viewed, even through high resolution electron microscope, it just gives a magnified view of the surface of the unit. So, you take the real lattice. Suppose so this is your crystal, for example, and you view it. How much ever you enlarge and uh, are using electron microscope, you just see the surface of it. And this is what is the real lattice. In this picturization, 
you must see the three uh, take a reference and then if it is x y and z and the success the distance between successive atoms along x is a the distance between successive atoms along b is the b so if you take the magnitude wise it is the lattice parameter so similarly you have c and always alpha is between b and c so you mark alpha beta and gamma see in a cyclic fashion like this um, this uh, uh, this picture is clear. So this is what we call a real lattice. For the sake of students, so let me very quickly run through the basics of crystal in one or two minutes because I don't want you to be lost when I move to uh, move from reciprocal space. Uh, uh, so sorry, I don't want you to be lost when I take you from real space to the reciprocal space. Okay. So now you look at this picture. We are trying to get the primitive cell in the real space in the first place. So we must know what primitive cell is in the first place. So let me just explain. Uh, so suppose you have one dimensional uh, distribution. This is periodic, uh, periodic uh, arrangement of, in one dimensional lattice. And uh, let the, uh, the periodicity uh, be some A. So you can have, suppose I move from here to here. How many A's I have moved through? One. From here to your one and two and three so i can just say three times here this is how the position vector here is given with reference to this origin so now you go to two-dimensional lattice with the parameters lattice parameters a and b so now with the moment you have two lattice parameters or two basis vectors then you should have an angle between them so whatever is true along the x is true along uh, a y also in case i take this to be my y then any position of a lattice so suppose i move to this lattice so this r corresponding to this position can be written as a linear combination of a and b so this point how many units of a it has moved in along the x direction suppose it has moved through three then u will be three and along the z, if it has moved just to one unit, then v is going to be b. And that's how we write the position vector in the two dimension. So now you move on to three dimensional picturization. So now, the, uh, if when you, when you visualize this uh, three dimensional distributed atoms, and uh, just uh, to recollect, uh, you, uh, what is a lattice? Periodic distribution of points are the lattice. When the basis is fixed on these periodic points, uh, what you get is a crystal structure. So now this base which is placed at every lattice can be single atom, can be two atoms, can be group of atoms. But whatever you place at the periodic points, that should be maintained throughout. Now, here I would like to uh, clarify the nomenclature. So when we introduce crystal structure, when we say the lattice points, that simply means the periodic distribution of points. Like in Tamil, we call column, right? So column, uh, before making column, you put the points. So like that, you put the periodic points, that is the lattice. And then at every point, you put one atom or two atom, whichever forms the particular, develops that particular crystal. Then you are putting that unit on the lattice point, which is a basis put on the lattice, and then it gets the it gives the complete crystal structure. Now, in the morning session, I was talking about lattice vibration. There, when we talk about vibrations of the lattice release of phonons, we are not talking about those points as we talk in crystallography. There, we are talking about the atoms which are having arrangements within are the atoms which are uh, forming the solid not the point but atoms that is the nomenclature which you should accordingly understand in the particular context of usage now let me come back to this three-dimensional distribution so now suppose i i, I don't as it, i don't have these lines at all only this greenish dots then you will just visualize it some kind of an atom say every greenish dot is an atom so you will say see, there is some kind of a periodicity followed and these atoms are periodically arranged so now i just think of the situation where
there you imagine a unit. So in this particular case, if you look at this box, this black color box, and at every corner place the atom. So this black color box, which we are going to call a, a cell or a unit cell now. So this is a unit, I can call this a unit cell, which has this kind of uh, structure and which has got atoms at all eight corners. Suppose I am given this box and I'm asked to repeat it. Just put the box here, put the box along the X and along the Y, along the Z one over the other. And, the, and, and finally, remove those uh, uh, black lines forming the box or connecting the points of the unit cell, remove it. Then you get the same distribution of the crystal structure. So what do we understand? There are unit cells which when repeated produce the same crystal structure. So unit cells is the, uh, is the term I want you to remember. It is a known term. So unit cell is not uniquely defined for a human solid. So you can have more than two unit cells. When repeated, it can give the same distribution, but of the two unit cells, whichever is the minimum volume, that is called the primitive set. So now I'm driving, so though it is well known uh, our terminology and the concept, remember this is important for us to go to the reciprocal space. Fine. Now, uh, so, uh, you know this, so these are the different uh, uh, unit cells when repeated will produce a crystal structure accordingly. Now, the point is, the picture I showed you earlier, this looks so simple and the distribution uh, pretty much periodic just by looking at it. So it is easy for us to identify a unit cell which when repeated would produce a crystal structure. But if the points are not so simple and there are scattering of points, the points are there, but it is not trivial. You are not able to identify a unit cell just by looking at it, but still there is periodicity. So those periodic uh, distribution will also have a unit cell. So it is very difficult to identify a unit cell by looking at that distribution. So that's what I have written here. This is not simple and straightforward in certain cases due to the complex but still periodic distribution of lattice points. So in that case, Bigness uh, has uh, given a procedure, a procedure of developing a unit cell for such distribution of lattice points. So let's see what Bigness uh, has to say about a primitive cell or choosing the unit cell and that too, minimum volume unit cell which will produce the crystal structure. For those of you who are familiar with the various band structure methods, there is a one uh, method by Vignesets, so Vignesets cellular method, and it is the same person. So who gave that method of a band structure calculation theory, and the same person is uh, the one who gave this procedure for, for identifying the minimum volume unit cell, otherwise called primitive cell. So see the procedure. So as per his procedure, you take a distributed uh, set of points or distribution of uh, the given uh, periodic points or a periodic atoms. Now you look at it, so now I have chosen only few points over here, but you can, have, the same thing will be available everywhere. Because of periodicity, you can choose any point to start with as your reference point. Here, I, this is my reference point, this red color. So he says, choose a lattice point. So yeah, so this red is the one which we have chosen. And draw in the immediate neighbors. So draw in the immediate neighbor. So this blue one is the immediate neighbor. This is the neighbor, and this is the neighbor, and this is another neighbor. This is the neighbor. And this is, so we have draw in the nearest neighbor. What is the third one? Draw perpendicular at the midpoint of these lines. So for all these blue lines, take the midpoint and draw a perpendicular. So this is the midpoint, draw the perpendicular. This is the midpoint, draw the perpendicular. And so do here also. Fourth one, the volume thus enclosed is the primitive cell of the given lattice. So 
This volume enclosed by this red colored lines, this, this region, is the primitive cell for this kind of a distribution. This is applicable for any distribution. You can choose this procedure and identify a volume uh, and then repeat it. You will get the same structure. This is given by Wagner's red cell. Which is, uh, this, uh, the, thus, this uh, enclosure is the Wagner's red primitive cell. This is with the reference to the real space, what we see. Now we are going to the reciprocal space. As I said already, all crystals have got two spaces, real space and the reciprocal space. What is more meaningful is the reciprocal space. So I want to, uh, I want to take all of you to the reciprocal space. So <clears throat> the reciprocal lattice is the lattice in the Fourier space associated with the crystal. How the reciprocal axis vectors of the reciprocal lattice are constructed using the axis vectors of the real lattice. So if a unit cell is given in the real lattice, there is a procedure by which you will be able to visualize the reciprocal space of, its, uh, of the same crystal structure. So, so to give you an idea of reciprocal space so you may be wondering what is the need if a crystal is given yeah i'm seeing it yeah it is having a, a specific a b c alpha beta gamma you're seeing only the real uh, space but what is more important is the reciprocal space that is the interior which is also called the Fourier space. So if you take the Fourier transform of your real space, you get into your reciprocal space. So now look at this. So now for you to get an idea, I'm just telling you. Suppose it is, there is possibility for someone to remove the skull. There's a problem in the brain and just remove the skull. So when the skull is removed, this is the picture you get of the brain. So just by looking at that, you, uh, you're not able to uh, come to any conclusive uh, diagnostic uh, uh, information. So uh, what you have to know is whether there is any kind of a clot inside or any kind of a growth inside. So this is uh, this out, outer view of the brain is like a real space. But what you want to go and investigate is the reciprocal space, the inverse space, the into end, the interior. So you want to dive in and see what is happening inside. So if at all you could go in and take a picture within, this is the picture, which is the reciprocal space. So what is more essential or uh, um, uh, coveted is the reciprocal space. Now come to another example so another example is waveform analysis so in the waveform analysis a wave is given to you or two waves are given to you and you are asked to compare the two and give your inference so what you would do either you will take in terms of frequency or in terms of time period so how the wave is so if the wave is like this then you will say the frequency is very less and the time period is a very long frequency and time period are inversely related so for analyzing the same way you can either use the frequency or you can use time uh, as your uh, as your unit or as your parameters for discussion so if I take the Fourier transform of frequency I get into time domain the reverse is true similarly if I take the Fourier transform of the coordinate space, I will go into the momentum space because of course, Fourier transform of coordinate, that is just taking the inverse. So a coordinate is the momentum. So transform momentum and the reverse is true. Now, I'm not going to go for wave, wave analysis, but what is more interesting for me is the space. So coordinate space or, moment, or momentum space, in which way I want to discuss the results. Now, if I take the coordinate space, then the X, Y, Z. So any, any uh, object given, then I just look at it and I will be able to mark an origin and say how much is this point from X or Y or Z or angles, alpha, beta, gamma. So I'm just using only the coordinate as my language. Now, 
what is reciprocal uh, language. So the reciprocal space is also called as the momentum space. Why it is called momentum space? The quantum mechanically, the momentum operator P is H cross K, where K is the wave vector. So K is equal to 2 pi by lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. Hence the, so now you look at this. What is the dimension of uh, a K? So K is 2 pi, so 2 pi don't bother, divided by the length. So the unit of K is uh, length inverse. And um, yeah, hence the dimension of K is same as the reciprocal the uh, 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 reciprocal space or the length inverse and therefore when k is having the dimension of a length inverse then it can be called either as a, a, a momentum space or as a k space hope you understand so quantum mechanically momentum operator is h cross k where h cross is constant but take only the k because of its relationship with lambda with the inverse length, the dimension of K is length inverse. So momentum also can be expressed in terms of K. So the space in which we use K as for reference is called the momentum space or K space. To summarize this concept, let me repeat. If the crystal is given, outwardly I look at it and I will be able to use the coordinates X, Y, and Z. The surface of it, x, y, z. Any point on the surface, I just need the coordinates, x, y, z. But when I take the Fourier transform, when I when I go in, then I'm going into the length inverse space, which is the k space. So now, when I analyze anything in the reciprocal space, I should not use x, y, z, but I should replace it with a momentum uh, vector k, k, x ky and kz where k is equal to square root of kx squares plus kx square plus ky square plus kz square so here coordinate their momentum here xyz are, are uh, you can put uh, position coordinate r here it is only the components of k kx ky kz or k so from the real space take the inverse and uh, go to the dimension of length inverse that is your reciprocal space. Now, look at this. The reciprocal space is essential when behavior of solid is investigated. So, where the diffraction is actually taking place, when uh, experimentalists, when you use your X-rays, you take your sample and send your X-rays. X-rays are not going to go glaze through the surface. They will go in. So the X-rays go into the reciprocal space, pick up the information, come and give you the information of the reciprocal space of your sample. So the X-ray diffraction, what the experimentalists do, is happening in the reciprocal space. So the reciprocal axis vectors of the reciprocal lattice are constructed using axis vectors of real space. And if the real axis vectors are given, it is possible for you to construct the reciprocal lattice. This is also done in very basic solid state physics, but I don't want to miss it. I want you to give a, a, a clarity on the reciprocal space and, and which is also the case space. That's why I'm quickly touching upon all these things, though it is a very fundamental concept. The reciprocal axis vectors uh, of the reciprocal lattice are constructed using vectors of real space. So now, what did we uh, say in the real space? A crystal is given. A, B, C, three mutual uh, directions, X, Y, Z directions, the lattice vectors, the, uh, uh, sorry, the basis vectors, A, B, and C. The A is the basis vector along X, uh, B is the basis vector along Z, C vector is the basis vector along Z. So take the linear combination of these three vectors, A, B, C, you get the lattice vector, which would give you a position of one uh, uh, a lattice point from another or from the reference. Now, knowing this basis vector, vector A, B, C, you will be able to calculate the reciprocal space vector A, B, C, reciprocal lattice vector. So now, 
this is the formula given so look at this formula this uh, 2 pi this is for cyclic so because of the periodicity 2 pi is introduced you don't worry about it it's not going to do anything here but conceptually it is very important so knowing uh, a b c so a dot b cross c would be the volume and to know the reciprocal lattice a you must take the cross product of real space b and c Similarly, you can get the reciprocal lattice B and reciprocal lattice C. Now you look at this. So B cross C, or in this case C cross A, or in this case A cross B would give only area. And what about A dot B cross C? The denominator A dot B cross C would give volume. So area divided by volume. So denominator is left with a length, a dimension of length. So when you look at it, it dimensionally, a vector a is equal to 2 pi divided by some length. So what that is nothing but dimension of length inverse. K vectors are having dimension of length inverse. And that is what I, I just showed you. So K vector is the one which is having exactly 2 pi divided by lambda or 2 pi divided by some length in terms of dimension or K is length inverse. Exactly this is having similar. So this vector A, this vector B, vector C are actually in the reciprocal space. So or k space so they obey this particular orthogonal property and their linear combination would give the reciprocal lattice vector this is also known and so now if a real space yeah, vector a b c basis vectors a b c are given use the formula and try to find, uh, arrive at the ABC in the reciprocal space when and this is the, the uh, uh, ABC of simple Q substitute in the formula in the reciprocal space also you get the unit uh, I mean uh, the unit cell to be the simple Q but if it is BCC it would not be the case now you look at this body centered cube very quickly I will revise this so now there could be a lot of distribution but I'm just choosing three body centered cube and this is the first body centered cube and this is the body center and this is the second uh, cube this is the body center this is the third cube and this is the body center and again you can choose any reference so with the ref one, because of periodicity any point can be chosen as your reference point but one once you choose your reference, once you fix your coordinate, and after that, that should be followed throughout your investigation or calculation. So now, in this case, this is the reference point, and I'm choosing this to be the x-axis, and this is the y-axis, and this is the z-axis. Now, basis vector I want to choose, or uh, the uh, a, b, and c, I want to choose the body centered one. So let this be A and let this be B and this be C. And that now I have visualized it. I have chosen the coordinate. I have chosen the uh, ABC. And now I am going to write the values of ABC. So values of ABC, what is this A? It's exactly in the middle of this particular body center cube that is following here. So it is having a positive x half of positive x half of positive y and and it is in the minus z direction and that's how i write x positive y is positive z is negative i divide it by half because it is halfway through and cube length i have taken as n that's why half a that is half of the cube length in this uh, combination this is Cube length is again a so high middle point so half of it and <clears throat> x this is uh, uh, falling on the positive y and positive z but the uh, 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 but negative side of x and that is the combination here take this point to, uh, c this is at the midpoint if the cube length is a this is half of it and you look at with reference to the uh, two so this for as far as this point is concerned this has positive x 
and positive side of uh, 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 z but the negative side negative half means y and this is the concept this is how you choose your uh, basis vector in real space a b c and uh, substitute in your formula then you get the reciprocal space a b c which would be having the length inverse dimension but looking at this we understand this corresponds to fcc in real space and this is what is fcc in uh, real uh, uh, space so uh, you can see this is fcc at every phase you have one atom i'm going a little faster because this is already known just to give you a realization i'm just touching upon it so you can choose your point over here so this is the point chosen with reference to that point write what to say what is uh, uh, a, a b and c or uh, look at this same picture i have just taken uh, uh, so this to be the a and this to be b and this to be c from the picture we can write every point uh, say so this point if i see it is falling on the surface surface of x and y so a will have only x and y it's on the surface and here if i take the cube length to be a this is how it looks and similarly b it is uh, falling on this surface and here it is halfway through so uh, it is in the plane y and z so y and z similarly see it is falling here at the midpoint so half of a in the plane covering x and z so i have this see now this is what is the real space uh, uh, combination when we calculated the reciprocal space exactly the reciprocal space of bcc resulted in the same vector which are realized in the real space of fcc so now you do the reciprocal calculation so the three we have finished so calculate what is a and b e and c now you look at this this a b c happens to be that of the uh, 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 the real space of uh, b c c so this is real space of b c c so the, uh, uh, the, the, the we can conclude the primitive vectors of reciprocal lattice of fcc and all the primitive vectors of direct lattice of bcc so the, the real space of bcc has its a reciprocal space in fcc you take the real space of fcc go to the reciprocal space it looks like bcc so this is how we are able to calculate uh, from the given units uh, using the formula with, with uh, for which we have justified that each and every uh, reciprocal space uh, vector cbc have the length dimension and therefore they are equivalent to that of k so which has 2 pi by a length uh, uh, form of it so we are able to construct uh, from known to the unknown so from real to the reciprocal space now uh, here at the important point i would like you to know is on the experiment that we do so the experiment is done with uh, um, uh, uh, x-ray diffraction methods so to know the interior one need to dive in that is what is the reciprocal space i explained it with the skull dive in so who is going to dive in the x-rays will dive in for the experimentalist and bring in information but for theoretician so theoretical investigation require wigner says cell called the brillouin zone so now i am introducing brillouin zone the experiment is to uh, do it in x rays uh, which is in the reciprocal space and then brings the information from there the theoreticians you do the calculation in the reciprocal space so in the reciprocal space also not for the complete all regions you do it only in the first brillouin zone in the reciprocal space and therefore you need to construct the reciprocal space for any uh, uh, any structure that is uh, uh, any uh, structure that is uh, given to you or any distribution that is uh, given to you and choose the first brillouin zone in that reciprocal space and do the calculation there in the most symmetric points of the night so that is the reason i was taking you through crystal two spaces moving from real space to reciprocal space theoreticians now it is time for you to know what this brillouin zone is so 
Abrilov and so on is the primitive cell in reciprocal space of the crystal. Now, coming to this Abrilov and zone again, a lot of information so need to be given with reference to the Abrilov and zone, but I'm not going to uh, totally introduce the Abrilov and zone to the fullest form from the basic to what is used to today in the calculation because that would be too much. So as I take you through in the development, chronological development of theory of electrons, I will also be developing the idea of a Brillouin zone because that is how the clarity of Brillouin zone would be possible. And therefore, let's go to Brillouin zone, which is a primitive cell in the reciprocal space. The structure of a crystal is a, a, a representation in real space. Suppose a, a, a crystal is a reported uh, to be formed in the FCC structure. You read a paper, and in the paper they are reporting the crystal is or the sample is formed in the FCC structure. What does it mean? They mean your sample FCC in real space. Even though X-ray is the one which has gone and brought in the information, the X-rays have gone into the reciprocal space and produced the, uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, brought out the information, and that information is interpreted and that is represented as the structure in the real space. So don't get confused. What you read in the paper, what you report as your result is the real space of it, even though information is taken from the reciprocal space. So, and look at this. And this is just for your clarity. So, in the reciprocal representation, so all of you know this is how we have studied the X ray diffraction, where the Bragg's law is derived using this diagram. The rays go into the sample, and the samples have this kind of a, 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 a periodic point. So, you can think of these horizontal lines as planes, and these are also planes. And interplanar distances d, and the X rays go and come out, and constructive interference takes place here and brings in the information. So the information is represented graphically like this, but this is not the information. These X rays are directly going to give you. So you can you, but it is not from here to here. So there are a lot of intermediate stages involved in this. So uh, for now, for theoretical calculation, unit cell considered is the real space. Now I want to talk to theoreticians. Experimentalist, I said, you do it, X-ray does it in the reciprocal, you represent it in the real space. You theoreticians, you give the information, you take a particular structure, you give the lattice parameter, you give the space group, you give the symmetry, then the computer develops. So those of you who do computation, the computer develops the solid for the given, you also give the atomic number. For the given uh, at atomic number, it knows what uh, the size of the particular atom is and what are going to be the outermost electrons for that atomic number you gave and what would be the preferential position uh, because you are giving them uh, the symmetry and you are giving input as a lattice parameter. All the input that you are giving is the real space input. But what the computer develops is the reciprocal space, Brillouin zone calculation. It develops the reciprocal space for the real put, uh, space input that you are giving, does the calculation and gives you the result then you are representing it in the real space. So our language of understanding the solid is real space. Whether it is experiment or theory, the calculation or the experimentation done is the reciprocal. And that's the reason theoreticians, when you do any abidentia of first principle calculations, you do K space, uh, K convergence, K mesh has to be properly chosen because it is the reciprocal space. So K convergence is very important and most of you will not know what is K convergence, what is a K mesh. 
K meshes the how closely the K points are uh, considered in the reciprocal space. And there also you do self-consistency calculations and you decide what is the best possible K mesh for you from total energy calculation. So all that, what you are giving us the input and doing it uh, as uh, your uh, self -consist checking for self-consistency, uh, uh, all that comes all that come from this fundamental thing about the reciprocal space and K space. So now you look at, so just for your uh, visualization, I'm just giving you, ultimately this is how it would look. So because I was talking about the theory, when I construct a Brillouin zone in the next, uh, maybe next session or after that, I will just show you what is gamma and delta and all these things would mean. So, in this reciprocal space also, you don't take the entire space. You construct the Brillouin zone, where our first Brillouin zone. In that first Brillouin zone, I identify the most symmetric lines and the points and do the calculation. So, real space, reciprocal space, or the Brillouin zone. Minimum volume is the first Brillouin zone. Uh, the primitive cell in the reciprocal space is the first Brillouin zone. After constructing it, find out the most symmetric points and the most symmetric lines or the directions and do the calculation for total energy.